How many of y'all that series has blessed y'all, man? Walking in peace. So don't let go of this as we step into something else. I, I think we'll, we will revisit that teaching. We're going to hit it from a different angle. But I'm telling you what, if you can maintain peace in your heart throughout your daily life, it's going to change everything in your entire life. And the number one thing for you to do is to guard your heart. And so uh, we're going to stay, we're, we're going to continue with that. But today I felt very strong by the Lord to switch gears and to go into something different. And so <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. When I say the word holy, what comes to mind? God? Different? Cool? What? Pure? Somebody? What is it? Reverence. Excellent. Whole. It's good. Set apart. That's good. See, y'all are nailing the definition. But how many know that the enemy will try to take a word and hijack it and make it mean something it's not? How many know that he's done that with grace? Um, he's done that with righteousness. Um, and, he, and he's tried to do that with holy, with the word holiness as well. And, you know, man-made, how I many you know man-made religion has zero power? And so the enemy is always trying to encase a word in a false definition. Everything everybody said is accurate. But how many know that some people hear the word holiness and they think it's the way you dress? And they think it's the length of your hair or what type of clothing you have on or something like that. And how many know that's actually not an accurate definition of holiness? And another thing is that when people, can you turn me up just a tiny little bit, Mammy? Another thing that, um, that people, when they hear the word holy, they start thinking in terms of, you know, I have to be perfect. I have to be flawless. And how many know that word can also take people down a pathway of legalism and performance, right? And so, but this word, um, holy things are powerful. Holy things are so powerful they're almost dangerous. Holy things are powerful. Holy things are so powerful, they're almost dangerous. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Well, remember that the, the holiest place in the Old Covenant was the Ark of the Covenant, right? And how many know when the Ark of the Covenant, how many know when, when something holy meets something unholy or unclean, under the old covenant, how many know that which is unclean gets destroyed? Because something that's holy is powerful. And it is so powerful, just like when they took the Ark of the Covenant and they took it in the temple of Dagon, how many know that all of those idols kept falling down? Kept falling down. Why? Because the, the holiness of God was there. And then eventually they, the, those idols were decimated. And then how many know when that, when that Ark of the Covenant was in the land of the Philistines, that it, it actually plagued the Philistines because something holy was amongst things that were unclean, right? And then there was a time when uh, the children of Beth Shemesh lifted up the um, lid on the Ark and they looked into, unclean people looked into something that was holy. You know what happened? 50,000 people died. When Uzzah touched the ark and tried to steady the ark in an incorrect manner, how many know Uzzah died? Now here's the thing. How many know that God is love? And how many know it's never God's will for his creation to be destroyed? But when something is holy and it makes contact with something that's unclean, what's holy will actually destroy what's unclean. Not because it wants to. But because what is holy is powerful. And, you know, in Joshua 5 and verse 15, we see this, this statement made all the time when, when God actually shows up. And this is, um, this is the children of Israel before they're about to go into the promised land. And this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. How do you know, Jeremiah? Because when Joshua, said, when Joshua fell down and worshipped this entity, the entity didn't stop him. I mean, every time an angel shows up and someone tries to worship him, they stop him. This is a different scenario. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, commander of the Lord's army is Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? So this is Jesus, the most holy 
the Holy of Holies himself. And he makes this weird statement. And they always make this weird statement. Take your sandal off your foot. For the place where you stand is holy. How I many of oh, that is a weird thing to say in the middle of a supernatural experience? But it's said over and over again. I mean, out of all the things you could say, you better take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. What's happening? That sandal is not worthy or clean enough to be around the power of God's holiness. And so God, wanting to keep something destructive from happening, says, take your shoes off. How many know our God is a holy and powerful God? And I'm telling you right now, don't lose sight of the holiness and the power of our God in the midst of our understanding of grace, in the midst of our understanding of the love of God, because our God is holy, our God is powerful, and He is to be revered. Now listen to me. He is love, and it's never His desire to destroy but if you take something holy and you put it around something unclean, that which is unclean is about to just be destroyed. In the book of Revelations, in chapter 4 and in verse 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes round and within. They do not rest day or night, saying, and this is what they say. I mean, these are, these are cherubim. These are creatures that are flying around the throne of God, and they're seeing him over and over and over again for eternity. And every time they see him, this is what they have to say. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now this word holy, once again, it has, every, everyone who gave a definition was good. But it is not what man-made religion has called it. Can I get an amen? But at the same time, how I many know oh, we got to recover this word and look at it in spirit and in truth. I mean, no, you can't just study the Bible in English. You've got to study the Hebrew. You've got to study the Greek. You've got to study the Aramaic if you want to get an understanding of what's actually being said. So this word holy is the word kadosh. And it means set apart, separated. And this is the, this is the thing I want to focus on. Uncommon. 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 How I many of our God is an uncommon God? He is special. He is set apart. There's none like Him. He is uncommon. So when something is holy, it's set apart and it's different and it's not like everything else. How many know that you are set apart and you are different and you are not like everybody else? That's one of, that's one of the hungers that God has had in His heart, His entire existence, is to have a people set apart unto Himself. Now Leviticus 19 and I want, and God here, he, he, Leviticus 19 and verse 2, it says, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So there is a call to holiness for God's people. But sadly, I can make that statement, and immediately everybody's mind goes to behavior. Immediately everybody's mind can go to what we've been taught about maybe the holiness movement or man-made religion or legalism or all of these types of things. But we're, how many know that we're not defined by what we knew in the past? Yeah. And we can, we can take a look at the scriptures and we can look at them afresh and anew. We can hear what the voice of the Lord is saying to us. But how many know that our God is holy and there's a call upon His people to be holy? Right? Now, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to spend the next little bit overwhelming you with scriptural evidence that you are holy. I'm going to, get, I'm going to give you so many scriptures that there's not going to be a shadow of doubt in your mind that you are not holy. No man can make himself holy. No person can make themselves holy. How I many you know it's not the length of your hair or the presence or absence of tattoos or what kind of clothes you have on or whether you got this pierced or that pierced or nothing at all about the external. 
Because the blood has the ability to cleanse all who will call upon the name of the Lord. And what the blood has cleansed, no one shall call common. Once the blood has cleansed you, you are now uncommon. You are set apart. You are separated. And you are not like people who are not saved. You're different. And the reason you're different is the creator of all is now living inside of you. You are a living, walking, breathing, holy of holies. Because the spirit of the living God lives on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit will not move into a vessel that is unclean. And one of the primary reasons that Jesus came to die was how many know the, was the promise of the Spirit. Can you get an amen? amen? And so how many know the Holy Spirit will not move into a vessel that's unclean? <clears throat> so what that means is that when I was a drug addict, when I was an alcoholic, when I was an atheist, when I was a lying, cheating, horrible human being, spiritually dead, the enemy of the church, and I called upon the name of the Lord, and I said, Jesus, save me. He cleaned me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And he put his Holy Spirit on the inside of me. And I didn't do anything to deserve it. I didn't do anything to earn it. I just received a gift. And I'm no more holy 25 years later than I was the moment when I received the Lord. I'm just as holy now as I was then. Now, I'll tell you what, you could have looked at me. I didn't look real holy. And I didn't act real holy either. I wasn't one of these people who just like, pfft. like I struggled for a long time. But the cleansed vessel was worthy, was made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. And the Spirit of the living God moved in the inside of me. And I've been a walking temple of God. Every day since. On my good days, on my bad days, when I'm walking in love, when I'm not walking in love, when I'm eating the cupcakes, when I'm not eating the cupcakes, when I feel spiritual, when I don't feel spiritual. And how many of you know it's the same thing for you? When you called upon the name of the Lord, He cleansed you. And what God has cleansed, how dare we call it common? So I'm going to spend the next. I'm going to throw a ton of evidence at you. Now, here's the thing. In the Greek, there's this word. That it's the word sanctified. And it's hagi hagiazo. And it means to make holy. So, when we are talking about something being sanctified, we are literally saying, this is something that wasn't holy. And now it's made holy. Everybody tracking me on that? So, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. By the will, we have been sanctified. Everybody say, holy. holy. Everybody say, I am holy. I am holy. By the will, we have been sanctified or made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest that stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, everybody say, this man. After he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, because the work was finished. And he sat down at the, at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Say, I am holy. You got to say it. Say it like you mean it. Because I'm telling you right now, the holiness within you is greater than the sin that's in this world. The holiness within you is greater than the sin that's in this world. The holiness within you is greater than the sin that's in this world. The holiness within you is greater than the sin that's in this world. In this world. God has cleansed you. God has made you holy. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 10. For it was fitting for him... For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, talking about Jesus, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies, 
makes holy. And those who are sanctified, made holy, are all of one. For which reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. How many know you've been united to the Lord? And he's not ashamed to call you his brothers. He's not ashamed to call you his family. Because you're not dirty and you're not unclean. You've been made righteous. You've been made holy. And what God has cleansed, who are we to call common? The thief on the cross, when he believed in Jesus, was made holy. Without one good deed, without one honorable act. There's there's one thing that really matters to God, and it's His Son. And when you believe in His Son, you've honored His Son, and He says, come into the family. Sanctified, made holy. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 11, I'm rolling Grant style. I'm throwing scripture at you. Hey, I had him lay hands on me before I came up here. He said, Shabba, Shabba. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. You are washed, but you are sanctified. Everybody say, I am holy. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Do you see that? You've been made holy. Right? Acts 20, verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified, made holy. Do y'all see that? Everybody say, I am holy. holy. See, and, and, and it's so sad that man made religion struggles with this. And here's the thing. There's not some person in this room that's more holy than somebody else. I'm not more holy because I'm standing up here and somebody else less holy because they're sitting in the back. Can I get an amen? Amen. We are the body of Christ. We are the family of God. This is not a pyramid scheme. This This is not any level of achievement. God has done this. Amen? Acts 26, verse 18. I love this one. This is one of my favorite ones. Acts 26 and verse 18. Now this is the calling that's given to the apostle Paul when he stopped being Paul on the road, or he stopped being Saul on the road to Damascus. This is, this is the calling that Jesus gave to Saul after he, got, after he slipped off his donkey. He said, this is your calling. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified, made holy. How? By faith in me. That's it right there. Made holy by faith in Jesus. 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 Now, here's the next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, this is crazy because... And this, this shows you how this is a gift of God. The, how many of you know the Corinthian church was in gross immorality? Like they were doing dumb stuff. They were doing dumb stuff. They were doing dumber stuff than the average heathen were. Right? They were. Um, a man was sleeping with his stepmom. How many of you know that's wrong? That's wrong by, that's Jerry Springer wrong, right? <laughs> but he opens the letter... And he does not pull back from their identity when he addresses them. Now listen, he's not given a pass to sin because how many know he corrects the guy in the same letter? How many know the guy was not operating according to his true identity and he had slipped up and was operating in a false identity and that's why sin had dominion over his life? So God's not going to pull back your identity when you fail. Actually, God's going to come back and remind you who you are. That's how you come out of sin. You get reminded of your identity. You, oh, you know what? You slipped up. You made a mistake. You landed in some trash. But just because you stepped in trash, you don't turn into trash. Because you are valuable and you are precious, you step out of trash. And you keep walking because what God has cleansed, don't call common. And so he does not pull back from his declaration of who they are. To the church of God, which is at Corinth... To those who are sanctified, made holy 
in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now listen, he is calling the Corinthian church saints and also saying they're sanctified. Can I get an, can I get an amen? amen? Now, how many of you know, he still corrects their behavior? But he doesn't pull back for their, from their identity in the midst of the correction of their behavior. We have to be able to navigate those waters right there. The, the sonship of the prodigal son was not removed from him when he was in the pig pen. But the father did, but the father did not change his love towards him. But how many of you know the father wasn't happy he was in the pig pen? How many of you know the son wasn't happy he was in the pig pen? Listen to me. Nobody in this room is happy sinning. Oh, no, you're not. I don't care how hard you try. It's difficult to enjoy sin when the life of Christ is on the inside of you. You can try so hard. Believe me, I tried really hard. I did for a long time. And, and it was difficult for me to not act the way that God created me to be. And then after a while, you just get tired of it. And you make a decision to move away from it. But check it out. Check it out. This is important. God is currently teaching everybody in the room how to walk free from the dominion of sin. And what one person is struggling with, God may not be addressing in somebody else's life. And don't try to be somebody else's Holy Spirit. Let God be God. Let God be God. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because when God addresses something in somebody's life, not only will he address it, he'll address the heart. And then he'll give them a want to and a desire to do what's right. If God corrected every single aspect of our lives that wasn't perfectly in the display of the image of his son, we would be overwhelmed. See, I'm a good father. And because of the grace of God. But I don't overcorrect my children. If you overcorrect a child, you'll destroy their spirit. If all you do is correct, 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 they will be very frustrated. You have to carefully correct as the spirit leads what's needed to correct at that time so that they can grow and they can develop and they don't get overwhelmed. Can I get an amen? If you are constantly in a state of correcting another human being, you have missed your call because you are trying to be somebody's Holy Spirit. Now, listen, I understand we got to raise our kids. I understand we got to teach our kids. But how many know if you overcorrect, then that's going to happen? I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm I'm so sorry. That's not true. That's not true. But, amen. God love him. It's okay. Amen. He's like, oh, man, God love him. It's okay, buddy. All he needs is a couple. I don't apologize. We all have crying kids. It's okay. My, my daughter attacked me earlier and ripped my, uh, ripped my little mic. She loves taking this little mic thing. And then she, she, then she made me spill my communion juice on my leg. Oh, well, right? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We're family, amen? But overcorrection will destroy some of my spirit. God's a good father. And he will correct as he leads. But ultimately, how many he's, what he's endeavoring to do is to make every single person in here a shining example of his son in the earth. Not just in nature, but also in behavior. Amen? So, he tells them that they are the temple of the living God. And then 1 Corinthians 3.16. I'm going to go quickly through the rest of these. Know you not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is directed toward the Corinthian church who are in immorality. He said, don't you know you're the temple of the living God? The Spirit of God dwells in you? He didn't say, man, y'all lost the Holy Spirit. He didn't say that. Because the beauty of the new covenant is you don't lose the Holy Spirit. Thank God, right? Like he just lives in there and he's not leaving. He's not moving out. He loves you. He's going to be with you. He's going to help you. How many know under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit would leave? He'd get grieved. Why? Because the blood hadn't come yet and cleansed everything to the point where the Holy Spirit could be in a clean vessel. Amen. And then uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 13, 
Um, it says, In him you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, this is important, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. Everybody say, I'm sealed. I'm sealed. Here's the great thing about your salvation. Your spirit is holy. And your spirit has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Sin can't get in your spirit. This is the best news in the whole wide world. If sin could get in your spirit, then none of us would get to heaven. Because, see, a lot of times like we, we, we think sin is just like immorality or, or getting mad or whatever. No, sin is whatsoever is not a faith. Anytime you experience doubt, anytime you experience fear, anytime you experience worry, that's missing the mark. Now, I don't say that to make you sin conscious. I say that for you to rejoice in the fact that your spirit has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. You're a child of God, and nobody can take that away from you. Your spirit has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's the best news in the whole wide world, right? So your spirit is always holy, always one spirit with the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Amen? How many know you are now joined to the Lord? You're joined to him. Is, is there anything dirty in Jesus? Is there anything wicked in Jesus? Where are you? Right? So you're clean in your spirit. Right? But now, let's take it a step further. 1 Peter chapter 1. And here is the rest of the, the Paul Harvey, as they say. For those of you that are old. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I only said that because I heard Tim laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I repent. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to be funny. I'm sorry. We have we have two hippie gingers in the church now. You know what? I was thinking about that this morning. We got this one and we got... And see, they're here to keep me in check. We got one in the front. We got one in the back. Hallelujah. Hippie gingers on attack. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I love, I, love my, I love my hippie ginger friends, amen? I love these guys. They're awesome. But 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So now, your holiness that's in your spirit is solid. But how many know that we are not always uncommon in our conduct? And now we're going to slip over into that portion of the word holiness. I'm talking about being uncommon. How many know it's uncommon to not lie? How many know it's uncommon to, um, to not steal? How many know it's uncommon to keep your word? How many of you know it's uncommon to love your spouse? How many of you know it's uncommon to be faithful? It's uncommon. I don't want to be common. I don't want to be common at all. I want to be different. I want to stand out. I want to carry myself in such a way that I'm not like everybody else. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to swim against the stream. I want to stand out. And I don't want it to be just because of my bumper sticker on my car. And I don't want it to be just because of my Christian t-shirt. I don't want it to be because of those things. I want to be uncommon in the earth. There is an uncommon holiness that's been placed inside of you. His name is Jesus. And he's looking to work his way through your mind. As you hear the truth. So that he can take his uncommonness and put it on your hands and on your feet and in your actions and in your words. So that you shine like a light in a world that's filled with darkness. So that you are a preservative. So you are the salt. You are the light. You are different. You are uncommon. Because that's what makes a difference. And, and we've thought that our uncommonness was based upon our ability 
to have the same fashion. Let's all have the same haircut and wear the same clothes. I mean, that's actually not what he's talking about. We should be able to be uncommon beyond the length of our hair. Beyond the presence or absence of tattoos. Beyond any article of clothing. How I many we should be a Logan should be able to walk and look like Jesus. I should be able to walk and look like Jesus. Emily should be able to walk and look like Jesus. Uh, Connie should be able to walk and look like Jesus. But they have a different expression of Jesus than I do because they have different giftings and different callings and even a different gender. But how I many know you could see Christ? In an individual beyond all of those things that I just described. Yes, yes. What does Jesus look like? He looks like love and peace and joy and kindness and goodness and temperance and meekness. He looks like love. He looks like integrity. Yeah. He looks like honor. He looks like yeah. us. That's how we're going to make a difference. It's not the smoke that's going to make a difference. It's not the lights that's going to make a difference. It's not all that junk that's going to make a difference and everybody looking exactly the same. No, it's regular, everyday people like us operating as sons and daughters of God and being uncommon. Being totally different. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to, I want to, I want to look at, it's difficult to understand what I'm saying without understanding a spirit, soul, and body. Um, because you are a three-part being, you are spirit, soul, and body, okay? Your spirit is your spirit. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your thinker, your feeler, your chooser. Your body is your body, right? Your spirit has been redeemed. Your soul is being redeemed right now as you hear truth. And then your body is lining up to your soul. These are facts. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, it says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you. Everybody say, make holy. Make, holy. make you holy completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body. I'm talking about holiness within you working its way to the outside of you so people can see Christ in you. Jesus is more visible in Jeremiah Johnson 25 years later than he was when I was a 19-year-old and first got saved. You can see him in me now. You couldn't see him in me like you, like you can now. And here's my, here's my hope. Here's my desire. Here's my passion. I'm going to keep renewing my mind until people can look at me and, see me and see Jesus on me. Not just in church. At the house, sitting on the couch with my kids. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because the same Christ, that's, it's, it's, he's in us, but the expression of him, the necessary parts of renewing of the mind. Because how many of y'all, there are some lies that you believed about yourself that are not true. And the freedom comes from the hearing of the truth. That's why the greatest deliverance is not somebody laying hands on you. The greatest deliverance is not the gifts of the Spirit. I love the gifts of the Spirit. I love the laying on hands. But you know what's going to keep you free is changing the way you think. Renewing your mind. There ain't no freedom like it. There is no freedom like it. Like I used to be a very depressed person. Manic depressed, racked in depression, lived in depression as a Christian. Today, depression is nowhere near me. I'm the happiest person I know. And, it, and it's not, and it has nothing at all to do with me, but it has everything to do with the truth. If you'll take this truth and you'll apply it to your life beyond a Sunday morning, just like Aaron was sharing, it's going to take more than Sunday to get this done. You know, if you ate one meal a week, yeah, <laughs> you would not be happy. You're going to have to learn how to feed on God apart from the congregation of the saints. You're going to have to learn how to read your Bible. And how to listen to, to messages in scripture. If you want this beautiful life. Right. Come on. Now you're going to heaven. Which is fantastic. But I want some heaven right now. I want some heaven in my marriage. I want some heaven in my children. I want some heaven in me. I want to drive like somebody who's in heaven. You know what I'm saying? I want to eat cupcakes like somebody who's in heaven. Hallelujah. With no condemnation. Just. Sorry Drew. Sorry. <laughs> Happy is seeing that thing which he does not condemn himself. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Temperance, temperance, temperance. Amen? But like, we can win. I want to win. I don't want to lose. I want to have victory. And, and it will require renewal of the mind. Amen? But it says, sanctify yourself, make holy, spirit, soul, and body. Everybody say, uncommon. uncommon. And so, um, Romans chapter 12, you've, you've heard this a thousand times, but I'm going to read it to you again. Never think that the reading of Scripture is for the purpose of you just gaining information. Every day for probably the past two months, I've read Joshua chapter 1, 1 through 8. I know what it says every single time I go there. But every single time I go there, I align my soul with my spirit. When I read Proverbs chapter 3, I know what it says every single time I go there. But I align my soul with my spirit. How many of the word of God is alive and powerful and quicker and sharper than a two-edged sword? It'll take the fog off your head. It's not, it's, it's not just the gaining of knowledge. You open the scriptures and you read and you feed. And it will make your life better. Sometimes you're going to be like, woo, this is awesome, Jesus. And sometimes you're going to be like, <coughs> either way, just keep eating. Sometimes you hear the bells and the whistles and you're all happy and you're all excited. And sometimes you fall asleep and you've salivated on the pages of your Bible. You woke up and you got a red dot on your head. And God still loves you as you have fallen asleep, as he loved you when you were awake, as he will love you no matter what. Can I get an amen? Amen. But we live in a world that is pumping out lies 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, 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 and it's everywhere. And we've got to feed on light. If you want to see, feed on light. What is light? The Word of God is light. Man. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to change the way you think. Amen? John 17, verse 14. I'm going to roll through these quick because I've got someplace I need to go here. I've given them your word and, and the world has hated. This is Jesus talking. I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world. Just as I am not of this world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. Make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. When you hear the word of God, it sanctifies your soul. It changes the way you think. Don't get in the scriptures to see the way everybody else is supposed to act. That's stupid. You will be very frustrated with that. When I study marriage scriptures, I don't study my wife's part. I study my part. I have my part that I do. I don't do her part. I do my part. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't, don't study the scriptures to figure out how everybody else is supposed to live. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Because you're not feeding. You become a critic. You must study for you. Yes. Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, Romans chapter 8. A couple more places and we close. Amen. Hallelujah. Was the cupcake good? Yes. Oh, I know it was. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Temperance. I, no, I can't. I would be a hypocrite if I ate a cupcake. I told everybody not to eat a cupcake. I can't do it. Well, everybody's watching. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Woo! Man, no. How many we got left anyway? No, I'm just kidding. Looking back in the kitchen, I'm like, praise God. No, don't say it. Don't say it. Temperate and self-controlled in all things. Amen? I'm swallowing. You see me swallowing? Yes. This is, this is the body that thou hast given me, Lord. It loves sweets. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. I know, I know. God help me. Hey, if there's no milk, I don't even want it though. It's got to be some milk, like some organic milk, right? Drew, we just turn me on to organic milk. Organic milk will change your life. Amen. A little plug there. It is better than regular milk. Praise God. All right, all right, all right. Blah, blah, blah. Gotta give. <laughs> Woo! Cupcakes and milk. Hallelujah. Romans chapter eight. <laughs> Oh, come on now. Get thee behind me, Bambi. It's so good it doesn't need milk. Okay. 
What a strange moment in church, right? <laughs> People aren't throwing rocks, they're throwing suggestions of cupcakes. <laughs> Amen. All right, I need to get back over here. Romans chapter 8. Now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, this is real key. This is important. Your behavior never makes you right with God. Your behavior never maintains your rightness with God. Your rightness with God is a gift. Don't let go of it. The second you start going into your behavior making you right with God or your behavior being why God blesses you, you're under a curse. And your faith is voided. Because you're trying to earn a wage instead of receive a gift. That right there is just the nutshell of the gospel. You are right with God, not because of something you've done. You've been made holy, not because of something you've done. And we just can't even add anything to it. We just got to sit there for a little uncomfortable moment of, 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 the, of the offense of the cross. It actually has nothing at all to do with you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry, it won't tickle, it won't tickle your ears. It won't, it won't give you any credit whatsoever. There's only one person that's going to be glorified here today. His name's Jesus. It ain't going to be me. It ain't going to be you. It ain't going to be this church. Jesus Christ is the only one that finished it. Now it's a gift. Now that it is a gift and you've been made right, the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit will lead you in love to fulfill the requirements of the law. Now I'm talking about your behavior. The law can tell you not to commit adultery, right? But the law can't make you love your spouse. You know who can make you love your spouse? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The law can tell you not to steal. The law can't make you want to give. You know who can make you want to give? Holy Spirit. The law can tell you not to take the Lord's name in vain. But how many know the law can't make you want to worship the Lord? So listen. The Spirit of God will actually fulfill the law in your conduct as you are led by His Spirit. And it's actually going to go way past the Ten Commandments. Because not only are you not going to commit adultery, you're going to love your spouse. Not only are you not going to steal, but you're going to be a giver. Yes. Not only are you not going to take the Lord's name in vain, but you're going to be a worshiper. Yes. Not only are you not going to murder somebody physically, you're not going to murder your enemies in your heart. God's going to lead you to love them and pray for them. Right. I'm talking about the fulfillment of the requirements of the law in terms of our conduct. I'm talking about be ye holy as I am holy in your conduct. In your actions. Now this is real key. When you mess up, you don't stop being holy. When you mess up, you don't stop being righteous. Everybody tracking me here? If you did, then Jesus didn't have to die. I'm not pulling any punches on this gospel no more. I'm preaching it hard. In the church, on the radio, I'm done. Who, let, whoever wants to get mad, let him get mad. I don't care. It is the truth. God did this for us. God did this for us. He made this to where we can't mess it up. He did an awesome job. And so when you fail, what do you do? Wrap your arms around Jesus and thank Him for dying for you. When you mess up and you make a mistake, wrap your arms around Jesus and thank Him for dying for you. And you say what God said about you. You say, no, I'm a child of God. I'm the righteousness of God. I may have made a mistake. I may have stepped in trash. I may have thought something bad. Whatever, whatever, whatever. This is my Savior. I grip Him. I hold on to Him. 
I'm not letting him go. Job said in Job 27, he said, My righteousness I hold fast and I'll not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. So in the process of the correction of your mind in terms of truth and getting out of lies, and as God begins to manifest himself through your behavior, listen, your behavior is not so you'll have value for God. God lo I love my daughter who poops in her diaper regularly just as much as my 17-year-old who does not poop in a diaper. I love them both. They are both my kids. I don't love one more than the other. I love them both. So God loves you when you don't poop in your diaper. God loves you when you poop in your diaper. But check it out. If you don't poop in your diaper, it makes your life better. Can I get an amen? When, 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 sin, when sin does not have dominion over your life, your life is better. Your marriage is better. Your children are better. Your finances are better. How many of sin is expensive? Yeah. It kills. Yeah. So you're not sinning to impress God. You're not sinning to make your life better. Right. And not only that, you become a witness in the earth. Because then you are about doing good works that glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, man, you want to know how to be happy? Serve. Serve in love. I'm not just talking about your church. I'm talking about each other. I'm talking about your family, your children, people at the gas station. Everywhere you go, just serve them. <laughs> it's such a joy when it's done in love. You don't have to be a taker. You can be a giver. And you'll be so happy because you'll, you'll stop living for yourself. And you start living for something other than yourself. And the love of God will flow through you. And you'll, you'll lose sight of yourself and consciousness of yourself. And, and everywhere you go, there's ministry everywhere. Everywhere there's people that need to be loved. When I walk around, I'm always reminding myself. I'm always like, kindness, kindness, kindness. Yeah. Kindness, kindness, Jeremiah, kindness, kindness. Because being kind is so fun. It's not weak. It's strong. I can, how many know when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he didn't lose one single bit of his dignity. When he, when he got the grime out from between their toes and he washed their feet, he maintained his dignity the whole time. He said, I'm going to tell you a secret. If you want to be great, serve everybody. He said, happy are you if you do this. I got my toe in this revelation. I'm just starting to get a little piece of this. And gosh, it's making my life so much better. Yeah, when I could just serve my wife, and I can serve my son, and I can serve my family, and I can serve you. What if we all served each other in love? Yes, yes. Wow, what would that look like? Yeah. What if we didn't keep score? Right. What if we stopped keeping score? Right. What if we just started serving each other in love? And God says, the more you give of yourself, the more I pour into you. And, you, and, and I have an inexhaustible supply of love, peace, and joy. Just get out there and be my hands and my feet. <sighs> oh, gosh. Thank you, God. Sin is selfishness. That's all it is. It's me. Kick mine. My pleasure. My stuff. Mine. I got to take mine because I'm scared. If I don't take mine, nobody's going to take care of me. Selfishness is a distrust in God's ability to supply all your needs. All your needs of joy. He said, I will give you the kingdom. It's my good pleasure to give you everything. <sighs> I'm just trying not to cry nonstop up here, man. I'm just overwhelmed. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Okay. Galatians 5, and we close. Can I have a, a something? No, here it is. Right here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah. I saw John walking around with a cupcake. I don't know what he was doing, but. I saw, was he taking it to Connie? Oh, good job, John. 
Praise God. I'm going to turn around and blow my nose. Is everybody cool with that? Yeah. All right. And it's going to be amplified, you know. I mean, we act like people don't all, we don't all blow our noses, you know what I mean? Like, we all blow our noses. Now what I do is it, right? <laughs> Give it to my wife, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Galatians 5, and we close. Oh, gosh. Praise the Lord. Mm. Okay, Galatians 5, verse 13. For brethren, you've been called to freedom. What's your freedom that you've been given? That you're the righteousness of God and you're holy for eternity. Never going to change. I mean, that's pretty good. It's not based on your church attendance. Not based on your giving. Not based on your Bible reading. Not based on your good deeds. Based on this, you called upon the name of the Lord. You're righteous for eternity. You're holy. Eternity. I mean, that's freedom. Such a small percentage of the church world understands that. Most people out here trying to earn these things. You can't earn them. They're free. For brethren, you've been called to liberty. You've been called to freedom. Only, don't use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. I mean, you can use grace and righteousness to be selfish. I dare say we all have. But here's the thing. You can't be happy and selfish at the same time. Haven't we tried? <laughs> We've tried so hard. But you can't. Like, you really can't. It doesn't work. It's okay. It's okay. He's like, dear God, will Jeremiah shut up? <laughs> I'm almost done, man. I got eight minutes. <laughs> For you've been called to liberty. Do not use your liberty as an opportunity for, for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How I many you know we're not called to treat people the way they treat us? You're, told, you're called to treat people the way you want to be treated. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then... Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. So do you not do the things that you wish? How I many know oh, there's a challenge sometimes to do what's right? And how I many you know when you do what's wrong, God still loves you, and you're still His kid, and you're still righteous, and you're still holy? Can I get an amen? amen. Don't let go of that. Keep your, keep your arms around Jesus as your righteousness. But I want to I want to teach you how to have a good life and teach you how to be uncommon. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now I'm about to say some things to you that are common. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. Everybody say common. common. Very common. Fornication. Common. Uncleanness. Common. Lewdness. Common. Idolatry. Common. Sorcery. Common. Hatred. Contention, Common. jealousy, Common. wrath, Common. selfish ambition. How I many old everybody's doing this stuff? This is common. How I many old it's not just common in the world? How I many it's common in Christianity? It is. In fact, if people are under legalism, they're probably more prone to sin, but they're much better at hiding it. It is. Amen. When you, I got, I got a, that's true from Dan. That's how you know you're preaching the gospel. Boy. That's true. Heresies common, envy common, murders common, drunkenness common, revelries common. And the like, and of which I tell you before, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, I'm not saying your salvation is on the line to be lost. But if you are, one, one time when I was struggling with an area in my life, one of the phrases that the Lord would speak to me is this. He would say, practice makes perfect. In other words, if you keep doing this, you're just going to keep getting better at it. And I'd be making a mistake. Practice makes perfect. I mean, that's my dad correcting me. Practice makes perfect. 
How many of you there's a difference between slipping into something and becoming skilled at it? Now listen, if, you're, if you have an area of failure in your life that you're skilled at, you're in a room full of people that have an area of their life of failure that they're skilled at. Everybody in here has, ain't no perfect people up in this month. There's not. So hold fast to your righteousness. Hold fast to who Jesus is. Can I get an amen? But know this, your father loves you so much, he wants to untangle that knot of lies that you believe about yourself. Because you've convinced yourself that this is somehow giving you pleasure and giving you satisfaction, when in reality it's hurting you and it's harming you. It's not just hurting you, it's hurting people around you. I mean, sin doesn't just hurt the individual, it hurts everyone around them. And it's difficult for the kingdom to function properly in your life when you fleshly lusts are warring against the soul. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? I'm talking about this. When you make a mistake and you fall into sin, it doesn't change the way God feels about you. It doesn't change your nature. It doesn't change your holiness. <clears throat> but it will change the way you feel about yourself. Your heart will condemn you. And if your heart is condemning you, it would be difficult for you to have faith towards God. And I'll take it a step further. <clears throat> sin not only will change the way you feel about yourself, it will actually also change the way you feel about God. Because it produces hardness of heart. And it will cause you to be insensitive to the Lord. And hunger for the Lord. It's just truth. You know, when something is used a lot, it develops a callus. And it becomes insensitive in that area. And you can be hitting it in a lot of different areas of your life, but you can have one area where you're consistently missing it and you're not really operating God's best for you. And in that area, you can have hardness of heart when you're very sensitive in other areas. How many other people can flow in the gifts of the Spirit and still have immorality? It's actually quite common, unfortunately. Because the gifts of the Spirit don't need a perfect vessel to function. If the gifts of the Spirit needed a perfect vessel to function, then no one would ever flow in the gifts of the Spirit. But God loves you so much that He wants freedom for your life. And He doesn't want anything in holding you in bondage. I don't know about y'all, man, but like, I'm start. I mean, I, there's a t I love to be free. Like, I've been in bondage to so many things in my life. I've been in bondage to drugs. I've been in bondage to alcohol. I've been in bondage to pornography. I've been in bondage to lust. I've been in bondage to lying. Like, I've been in bondage to, to, to many things, to fear, to self-hatred. But like, I'm free. Everything I just mentioned, I'm free from. And you know what? I love to be free. I love it. Like, I love to be able to not have lust dominate my life. Like, I, I got introduced to sex at a really young age. And, um, you know, even when I was a very little kid, I had a babysitter, a female babysitter that molested me. Um, I was around pornography. My family, my, my parents had pornography around. Um, I had this kind of cycle and then, I, then my, uh, you know, my role model when I was a kid was my uncle. He was a womanizer. Hollywood taught me that to sleep around is what it meant to be a man. And so I developed this massive cast and then pornography and all those types of things of lust. And it, and, it, and it ruled my life forever, it seemed. But do you know, today, I am completely free from that. I love it. I love it. I can look at a woman as if she is a human being and not an object. But I'm telling you, this world will teach you to view women as objects. It will teach you to do that. How many know it's uncommon to look at a woman as if she's a person? Yeah. Women, I'm sorry for the hell that y'all got to go through. It's ridiculous the way men look at women. It's It's awful. But how many know that we're, we're making a difference and we're making a change? How many other men in this room are getting free from this stuff? Can't get an amen. Yeah. So that we can be a safe place. So you can be around somebody and not feel like you're, you're an object, but you're a human being and you're a person. Can't get an amen. Yeah. God, see, and, and I don't fault the men. I fault the devil. The devil is the one that produces this type of stuff in men. The devil is the one that produces, you know, lust and pornography and all these types of things. But how many know we're getting free? Let's be uncommon. 
Let's be uncommon. Let's not be like everybody else. Let's be different. Now, in closing here, let's look at what's uncommon. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody say uncommon. uncommon. How many of you it's uncommon to really care about people? To really care about people. Not to have an ulterior motive. Just really actually care about people. And not just the people that can do stuff for you. Care about the people that can't do anything for you. And not just care about a stranger. But care about the people in your house. The love walk, rubber meets road in the love walk is not how a Christian treats a stranger. A love walk is how do you treat those in your house? If it's not working at the house, then this is a show. Amen. And, and as you become more uncommon, hold fast to Jesus as your righteousness. Don't let go of the fact that you're holy in the Lord. Love is uncommon. How many of joy is uncommon? Joy is uncommon. Ah, oh, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Peace is uncommon. Long suffering, being patient, uncommon. Kindness, uncommon. Goodness, the desire to serve and to help, uncommon. Faithfulness, uncommon. Gentleness, uncommon. Self control, uncommon. That's the one I'm working on. Against such, there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Did y'all see that? Final place, Deuteronomy chapter 7. <sighs> Let's be, y'all want to be uncommon? Yeah. Y'all want to be different? Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Let's be different. And listen, it, it, and, and if some of the things that I've mentioned you're still struggling with, and some of the things I've mentioned you're still having a hard time with, listen, just don't let go of Jesus. See, and, and I give this, this, this kind of thing to give you a visual, but it's actually more than that. Are you capable of ripping out one of your organs and taking it out of your body? No. I know that's a weird example, but how I many you know you are joined to, 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 as one spirit to the Lord? How I many you know He is your righteousness? He has made you holy. Can I get an amen? Don't let go of the gospel. That's the fight of faith. Don't try to have faith for all kinds of stuff. Just have faith to be that you're a son of God, that you're a daughter of God. Seriously, everything else will take care of itself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things. This is the fight of faith. The fight is for you to believe that you've been made righteous and holy by the blood of the Lamb. Just do that. Just do that. Everything else will fall in the line. Everything else will fall in the line. Someday, Grant's going to teach a message on how faith and righteousness are what I was like, come on, man, teach it. Come on, man. It's so, it's just, oh, it's so important. All right, closing. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. This is God speaking. He says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more in number than any other people. For you are actually the least of all people. But because the Lord loves you, in closing, God has always wanted his own people. He's hungered for it. He's wanted his own people. And so like, we're his people. <laughs> and we are holy unto him. We're separated unto him. We're his people. And we're his. And we're, we don't belong to anybody else. How I many you know we don't belong to the works of the flesh? We don't belong to the enemy. We don't belong to sin. We don't belong to lust. We don't belong to lying. We don't belong to fear. We don't belong. We belong to Him. We're His. How I many we're His bride? We're holy. We're set apart unto Himself. Right? And so He's looking to develop the renewal of our minds so that not only will we be holy in terms of our nature, but we'll be uncommon in our conduct. Uncommon in our conduct. Uncommon in our conduct. Uncommon. 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 Amen. Amen. And, and it'll make your life better. It'll make the lives of those around you better too. Amen.
All right. Grant, will you cl- come up here and close us out real quick, man? You guys enjoy that? Yeah. Golly, I enjoyed preaching it. So good. Okay. Now, um, really quick, we're going to take up our offering, but um, I just want to share just a, just a quick thought. It's not really going to be a teaching, but... Um, in the New Living Translation, Luke chapter 16, Jesus, he, he had taught a parable. In verse 9, he says this. This is New Living Translation. He says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they... Now, the they he's speaking of is not possessions. The they is the friends. Mm, come on, man. They will welcome you to an eternal home. And uh, the thought I've had is... Uh, People are eternal, mm. you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of what you're saying, we tend to treat people as if they're temp- temporary Wow. because a lot of people are in our life yeah. temporarily, yeah. right? Um, but people are the one thing that you can invest in that is eternal. And uh, I just want to say this. That's the reason I asked you to stay here. I don't think people realize, you look at this little church, you don't realize the impact this little church has. And it's because you give. Well, right? that's um, a good point, ju- Just yesterday, I did a, I officiated a wedding in Pikeville. And I had people coming up to me at that wedding hmm. saying, watch you guys every week. Well, People amazing. that I did not expect to hear that from. Well, watch you all every week. And uh, they specifically pointed out the way we dress when we preach. Wow. <laughs> Why? Because it's different. It's different. It's different. But, uh, yeah, so, so you guys make it possible. And whether you realize it or not, it's not just Jeremiah. It's not just Grant. It's us. Yes, come on, dude. Like, w- you make it possible. You know, just because people hear our voices, you all are the one that makes it possible. Right, and you're investing in people, and that's the one eternal thing that you can invest in. Because mm. so many times we talk about giving, we start to get wrapped up in, you know, and I teach about it a lot. We start to get wrapped up in what am I going to get in return, right? It's the seed that I'm sowing, and that's good, that's biblical. But there's an eternal reward here. Well, wow, it's good, man. There's an eternal reward here that you won't realize the impact of what you're giving this morning or this afternoon. To a thousand years down the road. Because well, people are eternal. That's good. Isn't that good? Yes, Amen. It is. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. Uh, we bless each and every seed sown that it will give a mighty increase in harvest. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, man. Amen. We'll go in the peace and the joy of the Lord. Amen. Have a great week. Maintain your peace. Uh, we're going to be eating tacos next Sunday. So, bring something in regard.